Shabbat Shalom. This is Shabbat Shemini. Shemini is Hebrew for eighth. The first significant word in the 26th weekly Torah reading. This was the eighth day of the period of consecration. And it is also Rosh Kodesh Nisin, called then Aviv, which means, of course, spring. The first month of the new year, which was given by God to our people, begins this year on the 9th of April. On this day, the Mishkan was dedicated and the people of Israel began a new way of worshiping God according to his specific instructions. What a propitious beginning. Harav Avraham Yitzhak Huk, first Ashkenazi rabbi of Britain's Palestine, later to be, of course, Israel, in uh, Maged Yerakim, wrote this about the month of Nisan. The Mishkan of God and everlasting freedom together will make a spring nation. Spring, Aviv, expresses the renewal of our natural human existence. For most of us, it's an emotionally energizing time of year. We may find our batteries recharging with each sunny day. We don't always get that many sunny days, but we're thankful for each one of them. Trees blossom and flowers uh, grow in, in a wealth of beautiful colors from the earliest white snowdrops and the yellow daffodils to the pink tree blossoms and the purple of crocus and finally the reds of tulips. Winter is passing and as we connect to the renew renewal of the natural world around us, we feel refreshed as new forces flow in us and through us. As a community, we can also reach new spiritual heights as we think of Pesach, the season of our redemption, beginning this year on the era of the 22nd of April. This is a time of new beginnings for all Jews everywhere, but it should be particularly so for those at this season who are reminded of all that God has done for us in bringing us redemption through the Pesach Lamb, Mashiach Yeshua. There are warning signs as well. Renewal includes dangers. One must know how to channel strength into true and holy actions and not into acts that are selfish and self-aggrandizing. We read with some shock of the actions of Aharon's sons, Nadav and Abihu, who possessed such tremendous potential. Have you ever heard someone talk about a person that you know and saying, sadly, but he had so much potential. I've heard people speak like that. Potential really doesn't count for much, does it? Moshe conveyed God's thoughts to Aharon. And Moshe said to Aharon, this is what Hashem spoke, saying, with those near me, I will be sanctified. And in front of all the people, I will be honored. 
This was not only about the present at that time, but much more importantly, it was about the future. The next generation, those who would follow Moshe and Aharon and serve God as the spiritual leaders of our people. But Aharon's two sons were tragically led by their evil inclination, not to enthusiasm and earnestness for the Lord and in the service of Hashem, but in offering to God that which he had not desired, with no attitude, with with no humility, but rather with an attitude of, of arrogance. And it's also been suggested that they were in a state of drunkenness. Nadav and Avihu took it upon themselves to decide what ought to be done in God's house instead of being the humble and obedient servants of Hashem. Of their father we read, and Kohen Hagadol Aharon was silent. His silent acceptance of the judgment of his sons by a holy God came from deep recognition of God's justice and righteousness. This response teaches us an important principle in the service of God, both inside and outside of God's habitation among Israel. God demands that his name be sanctified in the world so that his Shekinah might be revealed. Only through holy obedience do we become pure vessels capable of receiving the Shekinah so that it should rest in us and among us. Once more, we're reminded that fear of God will keep us from sinning, and later, fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. There is no question that fear of God took hold of the other Kohanim, the Leviim and all the people of Israel, when they saw how God dealt with those who dishonored him. God brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, not only into physical, but also spiritual freedom so that we might serve him. Our strength is from God, creator of all things, our king, our redeemer. Only when we come to understand this do we succeed in gaining fresh, new strength as the holy people of God, described by Rav Cook as a spring people. Have you ever heard someone say, that man has a spring in his step? <clears throat> That's the kind of spring we're talking about. Although the building of the Mishkan was concluded much earlier, the final establishment of the Mishkan happened on Rosh Kodesh Aviv. We had arrived at the eighth day and we expected the Shekinah, but the Shekinah did not descend. A delay occurred for reasons we do not know, during which Nadav and Avihu were struck dead by God's power. Of course, God knew what they would do. The feeling of the nation as a whole and of Aharon and the Leviim in particular, should have been one of total despair. 
But God's nature is complicated and profound. We must grow wise so that we can understand and connect to him in great humility. Only in such a manner do we succeed in acting with God. If we understand and internalize these thoughts as part of our reality, we will not follow in the ways of Nadav and Avihu, but rather we will honor and glorify God through our committed obedience. God says, remember who I am. Our personal and congregational relationship with God is predicated upon an understanding of who God is. And this is more often misunderstood than not in the world we live in. He is the creator of all things. Our creator, who had only to speak, in fact, only to think, and the universe came into being from nothing. He is the sovereign of the universe. He is our king. He is the Almighty One who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. He is also our Redeemer and Deliverer. And who then are we? We are created finite beings. We are subject to God's universal and eternal authority to his laws, both physical and moral, and to his commandments. In our own strength, we are powerless, frail, weak. The foundation of our relationship with God is the covenant made by God with our people, for which we bring nothing but our obedience. God said to Israel, and he continues to say today, do not make or set up idols or worship anything that is created and don't make yourselves out to be gods. Of course, that's what humanism is. Don't allow anything to take my place or come between me and you. Anything which replaces God in our affections or becomes more important than God in our minds and hearts is idolatrous. This is inclusive of material possessions, another person, success, power or position, personal goals and desires, pleasure and self. Why is God at such pains to encourage us to remember these things? Remember. Obedience alone is what we bring to our covenant with Hashem. You see, God is rightfully a jealous God. He tells us this repeatedly, and he means it. God's righteous anger <clears throat> is a consuming fire against those who walk in disobedience or rebel against him, as we see with Avihu and Nadav. These sons of Aharon made a point of poking their fingers in God's eye when they offered unconsecrated incense on God's holy altar. This is comparable to Cayenne's offering of produce when God required an animal sacrifice. God gave very specific instructions to our Kohanim 
which he expected them to follow in order to maintain their own purity and their standing with him as they interceded for our people. The Kohanim were supposed to set an example of holiness and obedience to Hashem for the people of Israel, just as Israel is to be an example and a testimony to the nations. Throughout the Torah and the whole of the scriptures, God takes great patience and pains to remind us repeatedly of these conditions and concerns. Only one who is purposely blind and stubborn can possibly fail to receive and understand this message. This week's reading from Torah speaks about one of the issues that affects our daily lives in a significant way, what we eat. Torah explains what we should view as food and permitted animals, fish and birds, that is to say, the other animals, birds, fish, etc., are not food. Why do you think God commanded us to eat in this way? Some of our greatest Jewish thinkers have given very different answers to this question. Maimonides, the, the Rambam, who was the liberal of his day, claimed that kashrut was given by God for health reasons. This is very popular among Christians, this idea. Abarbanel said, and I must agree, that unkosher food defiles us spiritually as it is contrary to God's laws. Others have noted that kashrut distinguishes us from the nations. This is also true. But the bottom line is this. We don't need to know why God gave these imperatives. We only need to follow them. Torah does mention a reason for at least one category of prohibited food, rodents. Perhaps this text also offers a, a clue as to why God has declared certain animals as non-food or traif. We read that anything that crawls on its belly, anything that walks on all fours, up to anything with many legs, among all swarming, <clears throat> pardon me, swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, you are not to eat them, for they are detestable things. Do not make yourselves detestable through any um, swarming thing that swarms. For I, Hashem, am your God. You are to hallow yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. For I am Hashem, the one bringing you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. You are to be holy, for I am holy. God warns us to be holy, and he says this many times, by following the paradigm of his holiness. Anything eaten that would take away from such holiness is unacceptable. Many of the animals that are traif, that is, not food, eat dead animals and refuse of any kind. Such animals, including pigs and lobsters, crabs, birds of prey, etc., um, are unhealthy for us to eat. But God says eating them detracts from our ability to be holy unto him. Laws of Kashrut require us to think more carefully about what we eat. And if we want to please God, we will eat 
according to his laws, as did Yeshua and all those who followed him. Seeking to be holy places limitations on our natural inclinations. Limitation implies control, and control is one of the things that differentiates us from animals. Holiness, the state in which God wants us to approach him, requires uh, human beings to insert God's will between our impulses to eat, among other things, and his action. Filtering our own inclinations and impulses through the prism of God's commandments is the basis of drawing near to God. Thus, we are directed to kill animals for food in a particular and ethical way and must not eat those that have been offered to other gods. So, for example, halal. We stand in awe of God. He is, he is beyond our finite nature and understanding. It is impossible for us to envision one who is the creator of all living things, of the universe, of light and darkness. We cannot imagine God's power, his wisdom, his understanding, his glory, or his holiness, which is one reason why, of course, some people, many people, refuse to believe in him. This awesome God has a blueprint for the world, past, present, and future. His plan is in operation, despite all attempts by human beings and Hasatan to change the program. No matter what fools might say, what scientists might say, what re religious people might say, what philosophers might say, Truth is truth. There is one God, and he is involved in our lives, even when we are not aware, don't believe in him, or don't care to be involved with him. God's overriding design for the universe is being implemented right now. Part of the blueprint, a part that comes logically near the end, is his judgment of those who have lived in rebellion, who have refused to obey his instructions and commandments, who have defied him and have chosen to do things their own way. You know, doing it your way, as old Blue Eyes said in the song, I did it my way. It's not an option. Some years ago, the Church of England issued a public statement declaring that since hell has such a frightening effect on people, it will no longer be mentioned. Does it even exist? Since God is the God of love, that is how they choose to market God. And all reference to eternal damnation, judgment, burning fire, fire and brimstone must simply end. Of course, comedians and songwriters can still talk about hell if they want to. And, you know, they, they do, but it must be in, a, in an amusing way. This brilliant theologically correct statement from the C of E was no surprise to many who already believed in the non-existence of hell and of judgment. Those who say, 
a loving God would never send anyone to a place of eternal torment. There is no life after death. Everyone is reincarnated. A second chance awaits everyone in purgatory. According to the scriptures, no such place as purgatory exists, and there is no second chance. There is, however, an Olam Haba, a world to come after this life. Everyone who ever lived will appear in the court of judgment and stand before the holy judge, at which time he or she will give an account of what they did in this life. If your name is not written in God's book of life, your future in hell is assured. Hell is the place appointed by God for those who rebel against him. The existence of Sheol, hell, is irrefutably taught in the scriptures as both a place for the wicked dead and a condition of retribution, of judgment for disobedient, unredeemed humanity. The Tanakh speaks of Sheol, which is usually translated as hell, a place which, um, which connotes doom, hopelessness, and futility. We read in Yov 21, the wicked in a moment go down into Sheol. The wicked shall be turned into Sheol and all nations that forget God, to Helim 9. Sheol is described as the place of future judgment. It's a place of eternal punishment, the abode of the wicked and associated inseparably with spiritual death. It is contrasted with the destiny of the righteous as a place of those who don't know God or who have rejected God. Rav Yeshua's perspective on judgment is offered in Luke 16 in the parable of Eleazar and the rich man. Rav Yeshua equates Sheol with hell and describes it as a place of eternal torment and fire, Matthew Yahoo 13, just as the weeds are collected and burned up in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom and throw them into the fiery furnace, where people will wail and grind their teeth. All the people who have rebelled against God will be judged. Their punishment will be in a place like a furnace of fire. In Matthew Yahu 26, Rav Yeshua speaks of the time when he will return as king to rule from Yerushalayim, and he will punish all those who stood against his people. He says, if you did these things to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did them to me. He will judge and curse them. This curse will be eternal fire. A place of fire is prepared by God for Hasatan and all his followers. In the book of Hittigalut, we read, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Only those who have had the blood of the sacrificed lamb personally applied in atonement for sin and who sought and followed God's commandments will find their names written in this book. Those who do not will be in a place of eternal fire. 
Why would God, who is known for his chesed, his loving kindness, allow anyone to go to Sheol? We read in the scriptures that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All that God asks is obedience to his commandments. We live in his world, so we should live by his laws. As the creator, it is his right to expect those who he created to act according to his laws, just as the universe acts in accordance with his laws. On the other hand, why would you want to spend eternity with someone you never wanted to spend any time with in this life? Why would you want to worship God for eternity, forever, when you did everything you could to avoid worshiping and honoring God for the 70 or more odd years of this life. As you choose in this life, so you choose for eternity. Those who do it their way will spend eternity regretting it. The appropriate and logical destination for those who reject God and follow the prince of this world in this life is Sheol, hell. Our God is a God of chesed, of loving kindness, but he is also the righteous judge. The day of judgment is fast approaching. While those who've received the atonement of Mashiach Yeshua for sin and have been reconciled to God will not be judged with those who have spurned God. He will expect us to give an account of our lives and how we have spent them. How are you living your life? Is your life accruing value or is it just being spent? Consider making the kind of changes that will please God. See, the Lord is coming with fire. His chariots are like a whirlwind to vent his anger and fury, his rebuke and flaming fire. For with fire will the Lord contend with his sword against all flesh, and many shall be the slain of the Lord. God tells us that Only those actions done in accordance with the commandments within his perfect purpose will survive the flames. Service to God will pay dividends for eternity. Spring, Aviv, is a time of refreshment and revival, but As we enjoy this season of new life, let us consider Avahu and Nadav. Let us consider the consequences of failure to take God seriously and to take God as his word. What he says will come to pass, perhaps sooner than you think. Have a good Shabbat. Shabbat Tov.